Good morning, guys. I'm going to go over a couple uh, basic electrical principles today. Uh, power generation, transformers, transmission lines, out to the field where you guys are going to be. Uh, get you a good look at what it's going to do before it gets to your oil and gas sites. So you're going to have uh, power generated at the power plant where it first starts. And there's a couple power plants uh, types that we'll go over. Uh, the term generation is a little bit misleading. It's more of change from one form of another, so one form of energy to the other. Um, it also cannot be destroyed or consumed, so um, it's always going to be in some type of energy state, but not necessarily in the form that you see out there. Here we got the two main power plants that you're going to see, gas-fired and coal-fired. You can see in the diagram, they basically follow the same steps. Um, there's going to be a different inlet and an outlet, but with a natural gas-powered uh, power plant, you've got a natural gas line coming in. Uh, you're going to burn that gas into a combustion chamber, spin the turbine, uh, change the electricity into a generator and out through the transformer. Coal fire, same principles um, other than the coals coming in through a, a holding plant through a conveyor belt instead of that pipeline. Natural gas, you got the power pipeline piped in, coals coming in through a rail or, or a truck offload. Same principle, goes through a furnace, uh, combusts into the steam, spins the turbines, and back out through the transmission lines. Two non-conventional examples, solar thermal. So you've got the uh, solar panels out in the field, and they could either harness the heat or they can reflect the light and send it to another power source. So with the solar panels, you're using a big storage tank of batteries, um, and then it goes into the turbine with that stored energy out to the generator, out to the same utility lines. And with wind turbine, as you can see, you've got the big uh, blades in the front spin around with the, with the flow of the wind through there. Basically the same as a solar thermal battery tank, and it also has a mixture of the transformer and the generator on the inside. So you see these a lot more um, out there it's wind is higher than solar thermal as far as energy efficiency, but it's still two unconventional uh, transformers. After you get out of the power plant, whether it's uh, coal or gas or wind or solar, um, this is where you see the power plant go to a step up transformer. So uh, the transformer is going to be conducive to the environment if you need 12,000 volts, if you need 400,000 volts, if you need 500,000 volts, just kind of where you are in the initial commercial or uh, oil and gas. It's going to go through the air on clear non-insulated steel cables. It's going to be passed through uh, long periods of time so it's got to ramp up to pretty high voltage. From the transmission lines you're going to go to a tra uh, step down transformer substation you see a lot of these in neighborhoods or side streets that are fenced in. This is where they start dropping it down to get to where their customer needs are. It can go anywhere between you know, 12 to 15 to 20,000 volts while it's going across the streets and overhead. Down to the last stop of the step down transformer, it's going to take that power 240 for a residential, 480 for a commercial or whatever your other needs might be in that area. We've got a really good uh, video about maintaining power transmissions, kind of gives you an idea of what those look like, uh, the high voltage lines and how they get taken care of. Um, we'll have that link in the uh, material package for you. You got three main power grid systems in the United States. We're going to go over a couple of them and see how they relate to the oil and gas and where you do and don't see electricity and where you need solar to fill that utility grid void. So the three power grids in the United States, you've got the Western Interconnection, the Eastern Interconnection, and then Texas as a whole has their own um, connection that's all tied in with the uh, ERCOT, the Electricity Reliability Council of Texas. So what you're going to see is the Eastern and the Western Coast where the Industrial Revolution kind of kicked off. That's where your main power, where the uh, electricity was needed and then they slowly kind of vein into the middle of the United States where it picked up steam. And then in Texas there was a big void in the past where they weren't getting the electricity and they were starting to have their own industrial boom 
and so they they started an old uh, a local co-op there. So the Texas Power Grid, with the uh, Electric Reliability Council of Texas, manages uh, 26 million Texas customers. So that's 90 percent of the state's load uh, with this co-op of uh, other interconnection companies. A little bit about that is at the beginning of World War II. Uh, several of the utilities in Texas agreed to <coughs> interconnect their systems like the bigger eastern and western interconnections. This, this gave them a little bit more to get the power that they needed that wasn't there be because of the eastern and the western connection. And so with the result of that, we've got 46,000 miles of transmission line, which in one state is, is quite a bit, but it, it reaches all over you know, to the, the Eagle Ford and the other shale plays out that you guys are going to be looking through. This slide's showing us a, a grid of the United States and the transmission power that you see. As you can see on the east and west where that interconnect is, you've got the uh, higher KV, the 500, 230, 345. That's where all your bigger main systems are going to be, so the, the load needs to be a lot bigger. As you get squeezed into the middle of the United States, uh, you're going to drop down to 140, 160, some 115 KV. There's less infrastructure in there. You can kind of see where the Rocky Mountains go in both uh, valleys on each side. It's not a whole lot of infrastructure there. Um, straight up the Rocky Mountains where all the uh, shell plays are. Kind of shows you why solar panel and battery backup systems are starting to come more into play. More power needed, more automation in the field. Uh, that's going to require a lot more electricity that just doesn't have the infrastructure there. You can see the Bakken up north goes all the way through the uh, DJ Basin, uh, the San Juan Basin down through the Barnett. You got all your Permian Basins right there and you can kind of relate those two and compare them and you're looking at all these oil and gas fields going up through that same structure where you've got the lowest amount of electricity possible in the United States meeting each other. And so uh, a lot of that solar and wind is also going to fill those voids and fill that gap there's a lot of wind coming off those mountains and so there's a lot of wind turbines that are placed in those areas. Oklahoma for instance has uh, a couple hundred thousand wind turbines that are coming off the plains down from the mountains and so that's where you get a lot of the unconventional electricity and the solar panel and the battery backup as well in those, those uh, open areas. Here we've got a glossary of common terms. Uh, that's quite a bit of information up there but we're going to touch on a few of them. We're going to go through a couple different demonstrations on how to get what with the other terms and so uh, we'll go over the AC and DC voltage amps voltage and watch uh, and pick a few of those to go over better. This slide we've got the uh, Ohm's law table on the right and this is uh, where you're going to get the calculations and so if you're looking for voltage specifically and you've got your power and your amps there's a calculation to get your result. Uh, as you see up here, volts is represented by E. On our table, volts is V. And so some of these are going to intertwine to where current is either going to be A for amps or it's going to be I. There's more technical documents. They have a different formula than what you're going to see out in the field or on some literature uh, for, with the products. If you got a result that you're looking for, voltage, and you got your power and your amps, you can do the calculation. The main term for power is going to be watts. You'll see a lot of your literature that shows uh, this is how many watts it is. And so when you type or when you multiply the volts and the amps, that'll give you your watts. The fourth calculation you're going to look for is going to be the ohms, resistance and wire. So that's the friction that's moving against volts and amps and it's going to create the uh, resistance that you're trying to get through that wire system. So we'll go over uh, in the next couple slides the rest of them a little bit more deeper than that and we can look at those. Here we have voltage uh, defined as the amount of potential energy between two points on a circuit. One point has more charge than the other. This first picture is a sine wave. It's the AC voltage. It's what you're going to use daily in your house. That's what you most commonly see versus DC which is going to be a car battery or a solar panel package or an electronic device, a phone charger, something like that. So with AC it's an alternating current. You have 360 degrees. Um, you've got the Hertz which is 60 Hertz in the United States, North America, 50 Hertz in some 
uh, European and Asian countries. But it's, it's just the amount of cycles per second. 60 hertz is 60, 360 degree cycles in one second. Um, with 180 degrees being a half cycle, that's where you're going to get 120 volts or 240 volts because they're going to be at a difference of potential in the rotation. DC is a lot more simple. It's a straight direct current which creates a charge, holds the charge with the amount of time it goes, goes out, it's used, and then it's charged again. So AC is flowing constantly. DC is a bank of power that will run out and need to be recharged. Yeah, so the question was, uh, are power plants generating AC voltage and DC one or the other, or, or what does that look like? So the power plants are only going to be sending out uh, AC alternating current. DC is more going to be a backup system. So at a power plant, they're not going to be generating DC. Uh, they might be using DC and helping that through the system, but it's just AC power coming through the transmission lines. There are some transmission lines in California that use DC, uh, but it's more of a trial period and they're just, they're not using it for commercial consumption. With the two different types of volts, AC uh, and DC, a couple of pros and cons. The long distance transmission, AC's ability to ramp up through transformers, it's got a lot less resistance, the ohms that we were talking about. DC is difficult and expensive to use in high voltage. There's a whole lot more um, power that it takes to, to gain up there because once you get to the potential, uh, then you start using all that DC, AC is just cranking through there. With the ease of use, uh, ACs, it's simple wiring circuits with transformers, and so that's kind of why it won out in the system AC versus DC. It's, it's a lot easier to manipulate. And then DC's uh, requirements are complicated because you got to convert back down to DC from the AC power source you have. As far as compatibility with the electronics, this is where DC wins. Uh, it's a lot more reliable. Uh, it's, it talks to the electronics a lot better. In AC, you're also going to need that same converter to get down to, D, to DC. So if you have uh, line power AC out in the field and you've got an electronic device, you're going to have to convert that down to DC. If you have a solar panel and a battery bank on site, that's already indirect current. So you're already using uh, DC and you, can, you don't have to transfer any. DC comes into play with the compatibility of electronics. And so AC, you're going to need that converter to get that line voltage to DC to talk to your products. DC with the battery bank or the solar panel or the converter, you're already talking in DC. And so you have a lot uh, ease of installation with some of the products like the uh, electric pilot and the ELO and our level switches, they're all ran off of DC voltage. Uh, AC is an option on some of our electric actuators. So our ValveCon, you can take AC or DC power. Tritex is also AC or DC. We just see the majority of the Tritex in the field are ran off of DC power because you do have a computer that you have to uh, upload that information on, and so you've got the DC power there already. Speaking on um, getting the AC volts down to DC, you're going to have two different things, and these terms are usually intertwined. You've got a converter. Uh, which is converting AC to DC and changing the voltage. And then you have an inverter, which goes from DC to AC. A couple examples of uh, AC to DC would be uh, sim something as simple as a phone charger. An inverter is a reverse of that. So you're using a battery bank, uh, solar panels, and you're inverting it to AC voltage. And so if you don't have line voltage out on your site, you can use an inverter takes a lot more DC, but you can get that AC power out there. Along with voltage, you're going to have uh, single phase and three phase. So your AC systems are going to work in tandem. It's going to be that two points with different charges on each line. So line one and, and, and your neutral, you're going to have to use both of those to get your 120 volts. Uh, you can have a difference of potential between two lines, which is going to double that, so from 120 to 240. And then you can tap your transformer with different designs to get another type of voltage. So there's, a, there's 120 volts and 240 volts, but you can wire your system to get comparable voltage. And so instead of the 120 
doubled to 240. You can also cut it to 208. That's where you're going to see a lot of your equipment out in the field, uh, depending on where it's manufactured. Some countries uh, are going to use 208. Some of them are going to use 240. Some of your devices can accept either 208 or 240, and others are only going to want to prefer one or the other. And so you're going to have to make sure the equipment out in the field is really what is going to be used with the power that you have at your hand. Another route um, to do that is changing the factory settings or just getting a, a different transformer out there for you. Definition of current um, used with amperage is the rate of flow of electrical energy through a conductor or a wire. So this is where the calculations come into play. If you have volts trying to get through a wire, that wire has a specific ohm measurement, it's going to create a reaction in amps. So if you have a 120 volt system with a smaller wire, your amps are, are higher just because of the reverse effects of the ohms. Bigger wire, your amps are going to be lower. Load, load side on the wire kind of makes that amp system uh, created through the volts and the ohms. With resistance uh, measured in ohms, it's, um, it's, uh, it's influenced by, like I said, the distance of the wire, the thickness, the temperature, the ambient temperature around the system, uh, and the material tendency to resist the flow of charge. So, like I spoke on earlier, your volts are trying to get through this wire, squeeze down, um, the friction and everything is going to create the amperage on that. And that's where you can get into issues if your wire is too small and your load needs a specific amount of amps, you don't have the power to get there. Uh, you're either going to have low power draw or reverse effect too much amps and you're going to ruin your equipment. With resistance, you can get uh, inductive heating. And so that's where you see a lot of uh, toaster ovens and electric ovens. You're forcing the current through there where it can't go anywhere. So the resistance is creating heat. And normally in an electrical system, that's a bad. But when you have it used to your ability, you can create uh, space heaters and cooktops with that resistance. So the last term I'll go over is watts, which is the, a unit of power defined as one joule per second. The way you get watts is volts times amps. So watts is, is what everything is rated. No one really is looking at the wattage. It's more spoken in amps. So if you know you have 120 volts, 5 amps, you're going to be able to get the watts out of there. If you've got your watts and you need to know what system you need for the amperage out in the field, you can do volts and amps and get your watts. We go over uh, your power system, but this is probably one of the main um, safest, most important parts of the power system is grounding and bonding. Uh, grounding and bonding are two separate terms, usually used vice versa. It's not really used in the right term. So uh, grounding is a ground or the earth. Uh, it's, a, it's a reference point for any electrical circuit. So Grounding is where you have the actual electrical circuit going to the ground. Bonding is where you bond metal parts that are going to have issues with static electricity or conductance. And so one of them is a main source that you absolutely have to have. Bonding is a safety factor to create a safer environment when you have uh, potential between either gas or another uh, explosive area. You're going to want to see a bonding cable out there. If you don't ground your systems properly and have all the bonding systems in place, this is static electricity is going to cause a lot of, a lot of fit, especially in the oil and gas industry where you, you've got your classes in your divisions. You can have electricity in this certification site. You can have electricity in this area. But if you don't bond or ground your system, you're going to have a pretty big issue on your hands. So static electricity is defined as an imbalance of electrical charges within or on the surface of a material. Uh, we all know that static electricity, when we've got our socks and we're walking on concrete and we create a, that build, you touch someone else and you discharge that. So that's the same as a bonding system. It creates that safe place to where you're not creating static electricity and whenever you turn on your electric device out in the field, it connects with the gas in the air and, and causes issues. We've got a pretty good example of static electricity in this video, uh, built up static electricity uh, at a gas station. So the, 
the gas in the air there is going to be the same as the gas in the field where we're getting processed liquids out. So this is a good example of what could happen if you don't have uh, your bonding system in place in a properly grounded system. You've probably seen the signs at gas stations warning about static electricity, and this is exactly why. A static spark ignited a fire at an Oklahoma City gas station. Crews say a woman began filling her car with gas. She then got inside of her vehicle to stay warm, which created the static electricity. When she got out and touched the pump, the fire sparked. The manager on duty rushed out to help. Fortunately, the woman was not seriously hurt. Getting in your car is the main way to create the static that can potentially cause a spark. Fire crews say touching something metal before you touch the gas pump can help prevent fires from happening. Another uh, big interference other than static electricity is magnetic inter interference. So we've got uh, a couple products that use magnets, whether that's the CEC2 level controller with the magnetic switch or uh, the badger meter systems that we use that uses the turbine and the magnet to, do, to have a pickup. So you can get um, natural magnetic interference in the area with the moving liquid. Um, you've got liquid moving at a fast pace in a metal system. The ground and the bonding systems aren't tied together. You're going to pick up a magnetic interference. And so uh, one issue that we've dealt with before is uh, on a compressor skid, you've got a metal skid without a bonding cable and you've got high pressure liquids going through a metal system, it creates a magnetic field around it and it'll cause your float to tell a different level that it really is. And so it can cause a lot of issues out in the field for you. Meter. Yeah, so the question is if we have uh, an AC motor next to a badger meter like our uh, electric glycol pump, it's got a big AC motor on it. If it's next to the badger meter, can it cause an issue? Uh, it, it definitely can. There's Specific requirements for installation, you can't have it this close, you need to have it this far, it's got to have a grounding clip. And so you want to make sure you install it correctly, and if you do see those nuisance trippings or uh, bad readings, it's probably because you have uh, magnetic interference, but that does happen quite a bit. With magnetic interference, you also have uh, magnetic hysteresis issues, and so when you have a big uh, iron uh, tank, you know, a big steel compressor sitting on a gravel pad, if it's not grounded or bonded and it becomes magnetized, that'll create a lot of false readings. And so you're going to either need to reverse the magnetism or have a route for it to, to dissipate on its own. So I hope this presentation has, has helped you guys get a little bit more comfortable uh, with the electrical aspects. We're going to see a lot more automation, a lot more electrical products out in the field where uh, mechanical and pneumatic devices were in the past there's going to be some more devices. Um, and so there's a little bit more knowledge that everyone's going to have to have and need to get out there. So if there's ever any uh, resources or questions that you guys have, we have a really good YouTube channel, uh, a lot of uh, videos on automation and some of the products uh, that you'll be versed in terms that we went over today uh, to kind of help you get there um, and feel a little bit more comfortable out in the field.